Hi everyone, John from Marco Learning. It is Saturday, May the 9th, and the exam is coming up um, for AP English Language. I believe we've got what? AP English um, Literature will be first next week. Let me close this down, make sure that I have everything correct. Um, and so my goal here is to just go over um, some, of the, some of the things you wanna keep in mind going into the test day experience, uh, some ways of getting ahead of, of the challenges you're gonna be facing, and um, to also go through another sample um, because we have some updates and we now learn, for example, that AP English Language and AP English Literature will not have line numbers, um, which just changes your options for how you act on test day. So as you guys are coming into YouTube, let me know how you're doing. Um, I wanna make sure that I'm actually streaming properly um, and that y'all can hear me and everything is set. Um, so again, if you like what you're seeing, press the like button. Let me know in the chat if you want to go over a particular topic or you have a concern about test day. That's what I'm here for. So a couple of things I'm going to do real quick. Um, I'm going to share a uh, just a quick schedule here of uh, what we're doing today on YouTube. So today it's 1 p.m. Eastern time. I'm doing AP English language. I'm gonna write an AP English lit essay as well. And then I'm gonna close out with AP Spanish language. We'll see Emily Glankler um, today at 4 p.m. Eastern time from Anti-Social Studies. She'll be joining us to walk through some last minute steps for world history, though world history isn't until the second week. Human geography is coming up soon. That'll be Danny Sanchez at 5 p.m. Michelle Cremo is gonna join us at 6 p.m. for AP Calc. And then Tom Ritchie at the end of his 1039th stream will join us for AP Euro. A push and gov, and we're going to post recordings of all these to our channel when we are done. So that's just a quick overview of today's schedule. Um, again, Langlet, Spanish language, then world history, human geography, calc, and then seven, eight, and nine are euro, a push, and gov. Um, so that's on our channel. Um, a couple things, real quick, I want to share with you. There is a College Board uh, exam day checklist which you can download from the College Board's uh, website. You go to cb.org 2020 for the testing guide, the videos, other resources, and everything that you could want there. And I just want to share this with you all. Um, minimize that. And um, I want to share this with you because there's a lot of stuff right on this document that you can use to just get yourself organized for test day. So you fill in your eight character ID um, and you can, and, and this, by the way, is a fillable version of it. I don't think that this is um, how the College Board set it up. So I'll see if I can share a link to this um, in the chat. So you have it. So you put your numbers um, here, your AP exam ID number, which should have been sent to you by email. Um, for those of you, you're going to be getting um, a, uh, an email from the College Board two days before your exam. Write the name of your exam. So this is just AP English language. Um, write the exam date, local check-in time. So the exam date for AP English language, and let me just make sure I've got this exactly correct. Um, AP English language, the first date is going to be Wednesday, May 20th. So this is Wednesday, May 20. The local, I'm Eastern Standard Time, guys. So I'm 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And, uh, or check-in time will be 1.30 uh, p.m., 30 minutes before. And then my exam begins at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Make sure you're paying attention to your time zone. Um, that's straightforward. I know some people in Arizona are stuck in um, limbo about whether they're mountain or, um, uh, whatever the other one is uh, that you guys are stuck with, but hopefully you guys can sort that out. And then it just goes through one by one, making sure that you can test these things out. If you have not yet gone to this website, cb.org slash AP demo, go there now, click on that, uh, or type in that link into your browser, go to that demo and try it out. I've gone through it each time. I'm gonna do a very quick overview of it this time, just because it's so important that all the questions you have, are you typing your essay? Can you copy and paste from Google Docs? Um, will my Grammarly uh, plugin cause this to crash? Yes, apparently, right? You're allowed to use Grammarly, but you need to uninstall it for test day. Um, but all those questions are things you can answer by going through the demo multiple times. Um, so, and then again, each one of these things that goes through the exam day docs are there during the exam. So this is this is a very valuable thing that the College Board has made for all of us. Um, so we can go through and get ahead of this. The best advice I can give you for test day is to practice and prepare and get rid of all the uncertainty, all the confusion and anxiety you might have so that when you go through 
um, the testing experience, it feels like a ritual. It feels like something you've done many times before. Now, one thing I'd like to do before I write my essay for AP English Language is just go through, let's see if I can find this here. Um, no, that's not it. Give me one moment. I'm going to find the document that I have, which is this, the, uh, the, it's the exam day checklist. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to walk you through the demo real quick um, to just show you some, some very important nuances that you want to make sure you've got sorted out. So real quick, again, Chrome is recommended. These browsers are supported. Internet Explorer is not. They give you some reminders here. You get to the exam day website uh, thing, you can, uh, the demo, you can just enter the word practice. You do, you press continue. It takes you to this page where you say get started. You then fill out all of this information here um, and you wait for your exam to start. Once you get past this page, you will see, um, and in fact, uh, one second, Okay, so once you get once you get to this page, you will see uh, it will open up the three different ways you can submit your exam. You can attach a file, you can attach photos up to five, and you can copy and paste. And for all the nuances, I'm going to encourage you to go there. I don't want to. Um, I really do want to get to AP English language specific stuff, but you can see they have all the rules and regulations right inside the demo about what you must do to <clears throat> attach a file, what you must do to attach um, the uh, images. Um, here are some examples of what images are supposed to look like um, and all the rules and regulations. They also then will let you inside. They'll show you, you know, here's what your exam will look like. Um, and then you're able to get to work. Um, there's a, what attaching a text file versus attaching photos was like. Actually do it. Actually grab a text file and upload it in and see how it works. Microsoft Word or Google Docs. And here's copying and pasting. So it's all there for you. Um, <clears throat> let's get to work on AP English language and what you what we can do. And at the end, I'm going to close with sort of test day checklist stuff. Um, but we've got a little bit of time because we have another whole weekend before the AP English language <clears throat> exam. And we're going to go live next weekend um, to, to go through these uh, details. OK, <clears throat> so just give me one moment. I am going to um, pull up a sample that I think is going to be really um, helpful because it's nice and short. Remember, we know that the AP English language exam is only going to have about a 600 word passage. We, um, we know on AP English literature, you won't be given the author and title uh, of the work. You'll be given the date and that's it. AP English language, I don't think that they've specified that. So our assumption should be that um, you might get some of that information that might help you set up the rhetorical purpose, the rhetorical um, situation that the author finds himself in. Remember what I'm saying when I say rhetorical situation um, is the circumstances, the who, what, where, when, why, in which an author is reading or writing or producing their text that helps me understand why the author made the choices that he or she did. So if my rhetorical uh, situation is a speech delivered by the President of the United States as the State of the Union address, that is a very particular kind of rhetorical situation that I want to pay attention to. So let's do this. I'm going to share my screen um, and I'm going to uh, just set this up here. I'll call this my AP English language FRQ because that's what it is. I'm going to put in my AP ID number, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and my initials. This is how I'm supposed to format just that first page. I don't need to do anything else besides this if I'm going to save this as a document and upload it. And remember, saving a Google Doc as a document is as simple as download Microsoft Word. So once I'm done saving it, I can download it as a Microsoft Word document. I can download it and upload it as an open document format, an ODT or PDF, PDF is even safer, I think. Um, and I can upload this or this, um, as well as a TXT. Any of those are fair game, not all of the other ones. As the file that I upload, if that's how I choose to perform the, uh, to upload the uh, exam. Okay, so let's take a look at this uh, prompt. 
I'll get right into it. And let me know if you can see that, if you're having any, any tech issues at all. We've got a live chat here on YouTube. It's great to see all of you. If you like what you're seeing, press the like button and let me know. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. This is our own little adventure. I'm gonna write an awkward bad essay live and we'll all get through it together. In 2009, at a conference for the US wireless, wireless communications industry, Federal Communications Commission FCC Chairman Julius Genachowski gave a speech about creating and regulating an open internet. The passage below is an excerpt from that speech. Read the passage carefully. Write an essay that analyzes the rhetorical choices Genachowski makes to the wireless industry executives to advocate for net neutrality rules. Okay, uh, what? I got lost in all this. So. There's this kind of, like, this is part of the stable, what we call stable prompt wording, the stuff that they always put in. Um, and so all the stuff before this is the situation, the who, what, where, when, why. And then this is my command, the rhetorical choices that he makes to the wireless industry executives to advocate for net neutrality rules. So I know his purpose, he's here to advocate for net neutrality, whatever that is. Um, so let's take a look. I know the speech is from 2009. It was 11 years ago. It was at a conference. So it's a very public event. It's the US wireless communications industry. So it's insiders. Um, it's people, it's, it's not an event that you or I are gonna go to in our spare time, like unless we're nerds and we'd like to do this. Like this is a very specific kind of um, event. And you know what, if this is difficult guys, thank you for, um, let's just see if this is a little bit clearer. And if you are watching on your phone, um, it might be a little bit hard to see, maybe rotate your phone or try to watch on a desktop if you have one uh, or a laptop, because this way you can uh, hopefully get a look at, at what I'm saying. And let me know guys in the comments, whether or not you can see um, this text clearly. So 2009 Conference for Wireless Communications Industry, Federal Communications Commission Chairman Julius Genachowski gave a speech about creating and regulating an open internet. This is an excerpt from that speech. So I know the audience, the US wireless communications industry, I know that the speaker is, he's chairman of the Federal Communications Commission. So some government organization that focuses on communications. I know it's recent and I know that he has to, I have to analyze the rhetorical choices that he makes to advocate for net neutrality rules. Now, one of the interesting things about this guys is rhetorical choices throws people off. Some people think rhetorical choices means strategy um, or some device I can name. Sometimes rhetorical choices are as simple as choosing to number your points or to set up a contrast between two things. A fancier word might be juxtaposing two things, putting, it, putting two things side by side. Maybe using the word but or however, right in the middle of the speech pivots the audience in a different direction. Maybe just repeating yourself multiple times. It's not about the quality and fanciness of the rhetorical choice you, you bring up. It's about whether you explain the how or the why, because what's the verb before this? You need to analyze this person's rhetorical choices. So don't just list them out. The person uses anaphora, um, repetition of diction, and ethos, pathos, and logos or something. That's not it. That's not what they're looking for. You can talk about all of those things, but it's much better if you say he establishes a contrast between these two elements in order to emphasize the importance of an open internet. He repeats the phrase, uh, equality for all to evoke an American sense of uh, our political, shared political values. He shares a story from his own life in order to convey his, his deep emotional connection to this topic and win over his audience. Whatever those things are, notice that it's just about getting analytical, not about a fancy name. So let's get right into it. This should be the same on test day. This is standard stuff. You need to respond to the prompt with a thesis. You'll earn one point for the thesis. Um, if you, and it's, we recommend you put it right there in the first paragraph, make it nice and clear for people um, that you have, you can earn up to four points for using evidence and explaining how that evidence supports your thesis. And then along the way, you can earn a point for sophistication if they really like your essay, um, because you show how complicated the rhetorical situation is, because you demonstrate that you understand 
other perspectives besides the one you've laid out here, or your writing style is particularly sophisticated. A lot of people are getting distracted by the sophistication point. The real task, guys, is to get that thesis, get that evidence and commentary out, and along the way, hopefully you write this beautiful essay. Okay, let's dive into the text. I'm going to keep notes as I go. I won't use line references um, because line references will not appear on the exam. So. I have my document here. In, when I'm writing my um, essay on test day, this is how I would do it. I would just put all my notes up here and my essay down here and then delete this stuff uh, before it is. Remember all the stuff you have in your document, like outline stuff and other people's words or a template, be careful. You don't wanna submit any of those things. You have to make sure this is all your own original work. Okay, so this is Chairman Genachowski. I don't know if I'm saying his name right. This is his speech. And I'll make this nice and big so everyone can see it. In considering the openness of the internet, it is also important to recognize that our choice of technologies and devices for accessing the internet continues to expand at a dizzying pace. Even though each form of internet access has unique technical characteristics, they are all different roads to the same place. It is essential that the internet itself remain open, however users reach it. While my goals are clear to ensure the internet remain a free and open platform that promotes innovation, investment, competition, and user interests, our path to implementing them is not predetermined. I will ensure that the rulemaking process will be fair, transparent, fact-based, data-driven. Now notice there's lots of ellipses here, these periods that cut off excerpts of the speech. That makes this a little more challenging. Um, it also makes it more, it lets me cover more of the speech in the excerpt. So it's an interesting thing. You'll, you probably won't see so many of these on test day, but it's something to keep in mind, um, right? You think about what makes a passage difficult in AP English language, the old-fashionedness of the prose, and whither goest thou, O oh gentleman? You know, if they go with something like that, that's going to throw people off. Um, as are things like this, the, the segmentation of the text. Now, let's take a look. Is there anything, it's not a very fancy style that this guy is using. Is there anything that you can note here that you could describe as a rhetorical choice? Take a minute, read it on your own. Let me know in the, in the chat. Um, what you come up with. I'm going to show you what, I, what I'm seeing. I'm going to read it again for myself. What are rhetorical choices he uses in this passage? The rhetorical choices he uses in this passage, and it says to advocate for the open internet. Okay. So, and yes, just to clarify, Elizabeth, your question, there will be no line references provided on the exam and you never needed to use them on the exam. I just, I, by habit tend to do them. You never need to reference a specific line The the readers will have the passages in front of you. Okay. So <clears throat> what are some rhetorical choices he makes? So one of the things he's doing here, he's kind of like, it seems to me like he's clearing the deck a little bit. He's saying things like, um, all right, I acknowledge that uh, this is growing at a dizzying pace. And I acknowledge that there's these technical characteristics. And I acknowledge there's different ways that people get to the internet. And then he states his purpose very clearly, which is great. And then he also gets ahead of these objections that people might have. And those are actually all rhetorical choices. So I could just say, I could just say in my notes, in the first three paragraphs, he acknowledges the complexity of the situation. What's nice about writing my little note here is a full sentence, which I do not have to do on test. I don't have to do anything. I'm just showing you the way I do it. What's nice about this is I've actually kind of written a sentence that I could end up using in my, my essay. He also, um, it seems to me that in paragraph three, and again, you don't have to reference paragraph specifically. He, um, I will ensure that the rulemaking process will be fair, transparent, fact-based, and data-driven. It's almost like he's anticipating arguments or concerns his audience might have. And who is his audience? Let's go back up to the prompt. It says that he is presenting at a conference 
for the wireless communications industry. And he is a government official. So he's using his government office to assure people that this is going to be fair, um, that the regulation will be well done, and that nobody's going to be left behind in the process. That's very interesting choice. And, and it gives me an opportunity to talk about the audience is the communi wireless communications industry. And he um, he's also, you know, when you think about who he is as a speaker, he <clears throat> has control over the regulatory process. Um, great. And it, yeah, Parallel, you're saying he characterizes what the internet already has and what it is the potential to be. I think that's really great. That's perfect. That I'm going to say I'm not going to write that in my response because I didn't think of it. Um, and I got to put like what I think of and you put what you think. And that's what's beautiful about AP English language and literature is it's there's a hundred great essays that you could probably write on test day. Write one. Perla, Perla, your first paragraph should be all about that. If you if, if that's an observation you want to stand behind. But we're only 15 lines in. We don't want to one thing you want to be careful about is you as you practice is modulate how much time you divert into taking notes in the first few paragraphs and continuing to read. There's really two ways up the mountain with this. I'm just going to take a, a step back and just point this out. Depends on your philosophy and your style. You could do a quick read, very, you know, just go through all 60 lines or 80 lines of the full passage and then go back through and start building this out, or you can stop as you go. And there's advantages to both. If you go, if you, if you read the whole thing very quickly, you'll get the overall picture, and that's a great idea. Um, but you also have to double read that way. At least my way that I'm doing it here is I kind of, even though I'll be coming back to the first 15 lines, I have, um, you know, I've already got some notes. I'm not going to forget what I'm doing. So again, I'm not saying that there's one perfect way, but th those are two great options for how to approach the situation. Okay, let's keep moving. This is not about government regulation of the internet. It's about fair, fair rules of the road for companies that control access to the internet. This is not about protecting the internet against imaginary dangers. We're seeing the breaks and cracks emerge and they threaten to change the internet's fundamental architecture of openness. This is about preserving and maintaining something profoundly successful and ensuring that it's not distorted or undermined. This is critical, right? So I should, you know, by stopping at paragraph three, I kind of missed this shinier thing to talk about, which is he very clearly says, he repeats at least twice here, this is not about this, it's about this instead. So this format, and this is in uh, paragraphs four and five, again, I do not need to reference the particular paragraphs. Um, it just, this is helping me doing that. He defines um, a specific issue that is not at stake and provides an alternative issue to focus on. Uh, and it's not even just an issue, it's a purpose, right? A, a purpose or a motive. So the purpose of regulating the internet is not in paragraph four, government regulation, government takeover, which people are concerned about. It's about this. It's not about imaginary dangers. It's about this. That structure is very compelling for an audience that might have in their heads, this guy's a government official who wants to regulate the internet. So he gets over maybe some of the stigma, some of the, the problems with his identity as a speaker. Um, he defines the issue motive. Okay, so, so I could say again, regarding the speaker, this which is emerging for me as a real issue is that he, um, maybe people are concerned that a government official will over-regulate the internet. Um, and so he gets, at, he anticipates that, that concern. Okay. Some will seek to invoke innovation and investment as reasons not to adopt open rules, but history's lesson is clear. Ensuring a robust and open internet is the best thing we can do to promote innovation and investment. So this is actually his entire structure. People say this, they're wrong, this is true instead. And that is extremely important for us to pay attention to as we go through this, because I think that this, um, that structure is a rhetorical choice that he makes. So we can talk about, for example, his structure is this back and forth, and I'll move this underneath here. 
So in my notes, one, I could even make a whole paragraph about structure. I could move chronologically through the essay. I like to do that when I'm writing my own essay, I just kind of move paragraph by paragraph through what he's saying. Or I could actually just talk about structure as a rhetorical choice, or and then talk about, for example, um, uh, his <clears throat> identity, his building of his own ethos and credibility or, or motion, connection in that way. Um, and parallel to your question about three paragraphs or two, there's no correct number. Um, I like, um, I like to write as many as I can, certainly a, a nice full introduction, two body paragraphs at least, um, and maybe a short conclusion to wrap things up. It really depends on what you can get done in the time that you've got. On YouTube, as I'm talking my way through this, I'm going very, very slowly um, through everything. He also appeals to history, right, on lines 27 here. So this is in line, this is, uh, I guess this is paragraph six, I think, where he's saying, um, I'll just note this, is an appeal to, to history as a teacher and a guide through all of this. Um, okay, let's keep going. We only have this at the end. Again, this is, this is an artificially short passage. It lets me make a better YouTube video. Um, it's the length of the passage will be around 600, I believe it's 600 to 800 words total, about 80 lines or so. We won't have line numbers. Um, but that's that's what you should expect. So a passage that's a good 40% longer than this, 30% longer, like the ones we did last week and the week before. Um, in closing, we are here because 40 years ago, a bunch of researchers in a lab changed the way computers interact, and as a result, changed the world. We are here because those internet pioneers had unique insights about the power of open networks to transform lives for the better, and they did something about it. Our work now is to preserve the brilliance of what they contributed to our country and the world. It's to make sure that in the 21st century, the garage, the basement, and the dorm room remain places where innovators can not only dream, but bring their dreams to life. And that's something none of us can be neutral about. Oh, I get it, neutral, like net neutrality. So <clears throat> he does that little wordplay at the end. This is very inspiring. I feel like the tone shifted at the end. So one thing I might say is in the final paragraph, there's a tone shift. That is a rhetorical choice. You're in one tone. Hey, people are saying this, but they're wrong. You might be thinking this, but you're wrong. You know what? Here's the thing we can all dream about. That is a rhetorical choice. So that I feel confident now because I have something to talk about. Let's go back real quick. He also, um, we are here because, we are here because, and in the previous paragraph we had seen, he said, this is not about this, this is about this. This is not about this, it's about something else. So we're seeing this sentence structure repetition. We call this anaphora, which is repeating the same sentence structure. And he does it multiple times. Uh, the initial, the same opening sentence structure. Um, at the beginning of multiple consecutive sentences. Uh, so I have a dream, I have a dream, I have a dream is the most famous example of this. Um, but we have our own more subtle version here. Uh, this is not about this, it's about this. This is not about this, it's about this. And then finally, we are here because. So I could definitely, if I felt like that was meaningful, I could talk about that as well. So, um, and in fact, notice the structure of this. Um, in paragraphs four and five, he defines a specific issue. The tone shift is part of this structure. I could even have a whole essay about the final paragraph, uh, or whole, sorry, a whole paragraph about the final paragraph um, and put these points in here. So I'm doing a very quick maneuver here. Um, and if I were to do three paragraphs, if I were to do three paragraphs, I could say, and by the way, you can do two, two or three body paragraphs again throughout this essay, but I might do a paragraph that talks about how he, uh, um, about anticipating concerns of his audience, right? Um, and that will go here. And so I'll actually, here's what I'm gonna do guys. I'm going to, I don't think I'm gonna use that. So I'm gonna talk about in the first three or four paragraphs or so, 
how he sets up the situation by anticipating some of the audience's concerns and allaying their fears right out of the gates. In the second paragraph, I'm going to move chronologically through paragraphs four and five, but along the way, I'm really going to talk about structure here. And finally, I'm going to talk about the final paragraph. So I'm doing something a little bit crazy, which is I am moving chronologically through the passage. That's my structure. But actually, each paragraph or segment I, I grab, I'm going to talk about a different theme. This is an attempt to earn the sophistication point. Um, it's, it's more about, it's not about like a conscious strategy, but just setting myself up for success. So let's get to work. In the essay, I need to make sure I have a thesis in this first paragraph. So maybe before I even begin writing the essay, I'm just going to make sure I have a thesis that really answers this question. So let's zoom out. The passage, oops, sorry, I almost twisted the essay there. Write an essay that analyzes the rhetorical choices that Genachowski makes to the wireless industry executives to advocate for net neutrality rules. So in my thesis, I could say something like, in order to advocate for net neutrality, Genachowski, and I'm going to do a little introduction before this, Genachowski anticipates his audience's concerns, addresses them, anticipates and addresses his audience's concerns, organizes his speech Or I'm going to do it this way, organizes his speech Okay, and he concludes his speech with a stirring <clears throat> and inspirational appeal to a better and more equitable future. Whoa, okay. So here's what I did. I split my thesis across two sentences. You can have a thesis that's in one or two sentences. Um, and let me just actually, if I may, real quick, I'm just gonna expand this so that people can see what's going on. Here, let me do this. I'll widen it out this way. Um, just so the text is a little bit clearer. Okay, in order to advocate for net neutrality, Ganikowski organizes his speech to anticipate and address his audience's concerns about, okay, so this actually doesn't work, that first part. Ganikowski organizes his speech to anticipate and address his, address his audience's concerns about net neutrality. He concludes his speech with a stirring and inspirational appeal to a better and more equitable future. Am I talking, let's go through this. Did I analyze his rhetorical choices to this audience in order to do this? I mean, yes, because these are these are choices that he's making to win them over. Notice how subtle this is though, compared to what a lot of people do, which is like, um, look at me, perfectionist, okay. Um, a lot of people try to write a, um, a thesis statement that goes something like, the author uses ethos, pathos, and logos to discuss the importance of net neutrality. That's too mechanical. It's too simplistic. Here I'm talking about organization, designing his conclusion, and making an appeal. And this I'll put at the end of my first paragraph. It's going to give me a lot of confidence as I go through the essay that I've got this thesis point. Remember, they give you the, ru the rubric right here, basically. Do I respond to the prompt? For sure. With a thesis that analyzes the writer's rhetorical choices. So let's get rid of this nonsense formatting. And I'm going to copy and paste this into my paragraph. I'm going to write a short introduction before this. Um, and I'll just clear this out, make this nice and organized. I could say. Um, in a speech to wireless industry executives, the chairman of the FCC, and, and here, I don't, you don't need to really repeat this, Julius Genachowski, I'm just giving us a little context, um, argues forcefully for the, for an open internet. It, now, that's just nonsense I just repeated from the prompt. You wanna have no more than one sentence, I think, that does that. Um, don't get lost in like copy and pasting all this. You, again, you can't literally copy and paste, but this is, you're not helping yourself. This is just saying, hey, I'm on topic. Okay, in his speech, 
Janikowski makes a series of important choices to persuade his audience that net neutrality um, will be a safe and worthwhile endeavor. Now, notice this is not a thesis point, thesis, um, because basically the prompt said, hey, he makes a number of choices. And all I said was he makes a number of choices. This, and, and here what I'm gonna do um, is show you the just bare bones of a paragraph like this. Certainly guys, write more, do more, be better. I don't know, but uh, the, you know, the clock is on. It's 1.38 PM Eastern Standard Time. I'm running out of time here, I gotta move. So a lot of people can get wrapped up in making this perfect, glorious introduction and they miss a chance to build evidence and commentary. Right now I got zero points for evidence and commentary, ladies and gents, so I gotta get to work. Okay, let's grab this first uh, set. Um, I can copy and paste my own work. I cannot copy and paste the work of others. Okay. So I could just say the first three paragraphs, uh, in the first three paragraphs, oops, of this speech. Remember, you can use any kind of spell correct you want. Uh, spell, or spell check or autocorrect or Grammarly, you just, the Grammarly plugin is the thing that causes problems with the software. And by the way, welcome to everyone who's just joined. Um, let me know in the chat if you've got any questions. I'm John from Marco Learning. I'm here writing an AP English language essay live because what else are we all going to do on Saturday? Trapped in quarantine. Um, if you like this video, definitely press like and subscribe to our channel. We're going to be going live all day today for AP exams, and we're going to be doing this same drill next week as we get closer to the exam. The first three paragraphs of this speech, um, I can say, Genachowski acknowledges the complexity of the situation. Um, and so he uses dizzying pace. He says that the internet has grown at quote, a dizzying pace. And that um, there are unique technical characteristics. Now notice again, I've said this before in my videos, guys, my quotes are very short. Long quotes don't help you. They're, you know, why retype the essay or rewrite it in your handwriting and, and, and just grab the little snippets that you're gonna be able to talk about. Now, dizzying pace and unique technical characteristics. Um, uh, let's do this. He points out that the internet has grown in order to uh, portray the situation as complex and acknowledge that the solutions will be complex. Um, this is not the world's best sentence, but this is an example of me, you know, notice I'm just using the pattern in order to, right? He's doing this in order to, not just describing it. The first version I had of this, I'll just go back real quick. This first version was plot summary. He says the internet has done this. A lot of people stop here. They just drop in a quote or do whatever. When I did this, I grew it out into something that was more analytical. Um, his audience, now notice, I'm going to jump in right into who his audience is. His audience for this speech was um, leader, the leadership of the wireless communications industry. So it is natural that uh, and because think about it, the wireless communications industry doesn't necessarily want an open internet, um, that this audience could have serious objections to government oversight of the internet by anticipating the concerns of his audience. Janikowski 
is able to allay their fears one by one. This is a defining, this is the defining structure, the over Okay, so he's able to allay their fears. So this is, notice what I'm doing. I'm talking now about, and I'm not grabbing little snippets of quotes and I'm not summarizing the whole thing. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about the audience. I'm talking about the speaker. I'm talking about the rhetorical situation. I can talk about how this is taking place at a conference. So it's a, it's a more formal tone. Every single thing that I say that's about the speaker and why he has to do what he has to do, about the audience and why they want to hear certain things, that's about the situation, about why he kind of has to talk a certain way. Every single one of those observations that's defensible, that, that's correct, is going to help me develop evidence and commentary. Let's see if I can get, um, oh yeah, audience and speaker. I could say, uh, by anticipating, okay, moreover, fancy, um, as a government official with authority to regulate the internet, Janikowski is, um, and what's this thing about, oh, this is not about government of the regulation of the internet. That's very important, that, that line in paragraph four there. Genachowski, um could have been viewed with some suspicion. Oops, suspicion, suspicion, not too fast typing, okay. Um, and that's, by the way, this is a good example of why like having, if you're a very slow or klutzy typer, kind of like I am, you might wanna make sure that you have that that's, uh, grammarly or autocorrect there. Okay, at the beginning of paragraph four, and again, you don't have to say this, you don't have to identify the location, though the chief grader for AP English Literature, David Miller, in the YouTube uh, video for the College Board last week, did suggest, um, uh, you know, a, a an opportunity uh, for you to, to do all this. So at the beginning of paragraph four, um, let's see, uh, he states directly that this is not about government regulation of the internet. Uh, this is a long quote, but a good one because he states plainly, I like that, um, that this is not about government regulation of the internet. Um, and in order to, notice I'm obsessed with in order to, because as a result, because he is this, or I'm looking for specific and concrete ways I can say I'm analyzing his choices, not just describing them. Then in paragraph four, he says this, that's not helping you. Um, it's not about government regulation in order to make his purpose even more clear. Okay, I'm getting some really great questions that I wanna answer in the YouTube chat here. Um, and Natalie, you're asking, at this point, wouldn't readers score this a four? That's a really good question. I mean, I definitely got a thesis, um, so plus one. Um, and then it's the question of evidence and commentary. What would, I've definitely used some specific evidence. Um, I've definitely commented on that evidence, connected it to my argument. So how many points would they give this out of uh, those four points for evidence and commentary? I'm not sure. Here's what I, my goal is. I want to overwhelm the reader. I want that reader, and I'm going to have two this year, I want both of the readers to look at my essay and be like, whoa, this is so much evidence. This is so much commentary. This guy's talking about rhetorical situation. He's talking about this. I don't want it to be all over the place, but if there's enough, I can, I can force the reader to give me more. Some people get panicked. They get trapped in their own heads, and as a result, they end up... Um, kind of locking up and producing less work. So there's this balancing act, guys, as you practice, are you, are you locking up from anxiety? Or are you, or are you just writing filler? Because some people are just, they start going and they're like, um, throughout the ages, mankind has had, like, like, my, like my typos, the editor that, and this is important for all people in this essay, I will. And they just like are going too fast and they're too messy. Money, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm saying your name incorrectly, do they mark you off for passive voice? One thing about AP exams, guys, that's so, so important. There's no marking off for anything. 
It's positive scoring. You either get a point or you don't get a point. Um, it's not like they're going to say, oh, no, passive voice. You know, maybe your teacher marks you off for passive voice. Maybe your teacher has a preference for how you're supposed to write essays, but that's not how this exam is graded. You get one point for thesis, four for evidence and commentary, and one for sophistication. So you're not being deducted from six. Your points will add up to six. Um, that lets you mean that means that you can make a mistake um, in theory that that you can have typographical errors. They know this is a first draft, so give yourself that generosity and openness that the test writers are are uh, going to do. Okay, so I'm going to just really quickly, guys. I'm going to show you how I might. Um, and notice, hey, let's say I'm running out of time. I'm going to cheat and put both of these into one paragraph. There's nothing wrong with that. There's no fixed number of anything. So I could say. Um, uh, some will seek, okay, this is paragraphs uh, five and six, uh, wait, one, two, three, four, five, six. So I'm just following this for my own sake. I can say, by the time that Genachowski finishes his speech, he has used, he has repeated a clear structure of anticipating and responding to his audience's concerns. He uses anaphora. This is me being very, very mechanical about like a rhetorical choice, but why not? Because he did do it. Um, he uses anaphora. This is not about, and this is about. Oh, it's about. In order to help his audience follow his point by point rebuttal of opposition to net neutrality. Um, can't spell audience. Okay. Um, so notice again, one sentence and that's really important. Um, that is, I'm identifying a specific rhetorical choice and explaining how it helps his argument. And I will say for Karima, your question, just to be clear, are we allowed to have Grammarly downloaded for the test? So it's a complicated answer. The answer is you are allowed to use Grammarly, but the Grammarly plugin and extension on Chrome and on other browsers can mess up the software. So they're recommending that you uninstall it. But if you use the Grammarly website or Grammarly inside of your um, let's say Microsoft Word program or whatever other version, you're okay, but watch the extension inside and definitely check out the College Board's website. They have some specific advice about this. Okay, so anaphora, blah, blah, blah. Um, he uh, defines specific issues, specific concerns, and provides, and here I'll just grab my own sentence that I wrote. Um, provides an alternative issue for his audience to focus on. Now, um, okay, final paragraph, okay. Okay, in the final paragraph, again, I don't have to be so self-conscious about these paragraphs, but whatever. The tone has shifted. The tone shifts. away from argumentation, from uh, a, let's say a highly structured argument to an appeal to, um, what does he appeal to in this final paragraph? A work now is to, okay. Take a look at this guys, take one minute and tell me what is he appealing to in this? And just to answer the question that just appeared in the chat, I like attaching a file. I feel like it's less risky, but both, I would practice both in the demo. Um, and I'll put the link to the demo right here. Just look guys at this paragraph for me. Um, and one second, sorry, I have YouTube up on a different, there we go. What is he appealing to here? Can I talk about, what am I talking about when I say he has a tone shift here? I'm 
And there's really several correct answers to what he's appealing to. I mean, he appeals to history again. He appeals to uh, a shared value of transforming people's lives, to the future, he appeals to the past and to the future. He appeals to our sense, you know, wireless innovators. I mean, maybe the an audience full of um, these people at the um, at the this conference are people who are tech nerds and and who um, get involved in in uh, innovation in their um, you know basements and 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 this this sense of a shared value uh, is very important. Um, yes, and money, your point here, um, appeal to the amazing ability humans have to use internet compared to past generations. So all, that is absolutely correct. Um, and again, I wanna really sh emphasize that your, your essay should be about what you get excited about. What are you seeing in this that excites you that you know is gonna be um, valuable? So highly structured to an appeal to um, shared values, to common values. The values he shares with his audience. <laughs> okay. And for example, here's how I might do it. Um, nope. That's there. Get rid of this. Okay. I could say, um, first, he describes the origins of the internet. He appeals to the past. Um, by describing, sorry, the origins of the internet and the great hope with which the internet began. He then describes a better future in which ordinary people here specifically, I can talk about uh, who is this? Ordinary people, including, quote, in their garage, basement, and dorm room, work from their garage, basement, and dorm room. Let me just make sure I'm quoting him accurately. Garage, the basement, and the dorm room. who work, right, then which ordinary people can access the internet freely and innovate. This appeal to innovation is another thing. I just don't have time to get through it all, sorry. Um, and, and then I can say something that um, indeed is, and notice I'm gonna smuggle in one last one, his um, subtle play on the meaning of the word neutral, it's really not so subtle, is it? Um, not so subtle play on the meaning of the word neutral in the final line of his speech. And just to remind you what that was, and that's something none of us can be neutral about, net neutrality, neutral, right? None of us can be neutral about this opportunity. Here, uh, the final line of his speech underscores his appeal to values that everyone at the conference could share. Oh, wow, I did it. Is this an amazing response? I don't know, who cares? Stop worrying about points. Stop worrying about sophistication point, how many paragraphs I need to have. Focus on doing what you know how to do. You've been writing thesis statements for more than this year, probably. You've been working in your class on, on how to develop commentary on evidence, on how to use evidence well. Those skills have not changed, guys. You can do this. So I really want to encourage you as you get ready for the exam, definitely stay in touch with us at Marco Learning. I'm going to be going live again next week. Um, and just remember that there's nothing about this crazy um, exam uh, situation that that is um, really different for AP English language besides the format. Um, and and so uh, you know it's the actual task has stayed uh, the same. A couple of things as a quick reminder. Um, and I'm just going to put this up here because we did call this test day checklist for those of you who won't necessarily see our, our stream next week. Remember, and this is in our Instagram story right now on, on Marco Learning. 
You definitely want to try to get a good night's rest if you can and set up your workspace in advance. Those are steps one and two. And then um, finally, you want to make sure that you work with the people in your household, in your community, your teachers, your coordinators to try to get the most quiet environment you can. I know it's not easy. Some of you have to take care of younger siblings and <clears throat> you know, there's all kinds of concerns about what's going on at home. Do what you can to get the people in your life <clears throat> on board with you. Uh, make sure you charge and check all your devices. That's easy tasks to just plug things in and wires. <clears throat> and finally, <clears throat> excuse me, make sure you have your AP ID number. That's going to really help you. Um, you're going to be getting your email two days before. Let me know if you have any questions. Leave us uh, anything in the comments about what you liked or didn't like um, and how we can help you at Marco Learning. Like this video and, and stay in touch with us because we got a lot more to do in the next couple of weeks. We're going to be on our Instagram account. We're going to be hosting some after parties after these exams are over. We won't be talking about the content until we can, but we're going to share um, our strategies. We're also doing some AP English language reviews on our Instagram account as well. So thank you guys. Stay in touch with us and best of luck on your exam.